I decided to do a paper about kinetic core oscillations involved in chromosome segregation. So the paper I'm doing today is called Super Resolution Kinetic Core Tracking Reveals the Mechanisms of Human Sister Kinetic Core Directional Switching by Burroughs et al. Whew. Um, anyway, that's all just a fancy way of saying uh, bougie videos of the kinetic cores show how they move around. So I like this paper a lot because of the cool figures and models they present, but before I go into specifics, I'm going to start with why I chose this paper. Uh, let's talk about my personal connection to this topic. Uh, the main connection is that this is part of what I study in my independent research. Uh oh. Bit of break. Attachment to the kinetic core, uh, specifically right now the NDC80 complex. Uh, it you, looks like this. Can you pause it? It has four proteins yeah. involved and the I one. I think we had, I had like a connection issue. Or yeah, something. I think your connection might have caught for a minute. I lost yeah. part of it too. Yeah, can we go back? Let's just go back to like a little bit. Yeah, like right. 30 yeah. seconds. Is the audio loud enough? It's <clears throat> plenty loud. Yeah, it's good. Okay. It's just like it's stuttered. The whole okay. thing froze for a while and there was no audio for me. So, no, it's, it's, right. it's working great otherwise. Okay, cool. Yeah. Before I go into specifics, I'm going to start with why I chose this paper. Uh, let's talk about my personal connection to this topic. Uh, the main connection is that this is part of what I study in my independent research. In my lab, we're more so focused on proteins involved in microtubule attachment to the kinetic core, uh, specifically right now the NDC80 complex. It looks like this. It has four proteins involved, and the one I focus the most on is HEC1. Uh, this protein has a tail region that worms its way into the microtubule to anchor it to the kinetic core. So we've done a lot of cool mutations on this protein, but one of the coolest things that my lab has me thinking about is how dynamic the system is as a whole. Uh, something I feel is barely covered in our college education is just how much these biological processes <laughs> move around. So microtubule binding during cell division always seemed like a quick process of the microtubule grabs a chromosome, the sister chromatids split, the cell pinches and divides, that's it. Uh, in reality, the microtubules have to search for the chromosomes, the sister chromatids have to oscillate to generate enough energy to split, and the cell has to coordinate so many motor proteins to fully divide. So, although I have more of a background in microtubule binding of kinetic cores, this paper focuses on this sister chromatid oscillation I mentioned before. Uh, by this I mean the microtubules pull the sister chromatids back and forth by the kinetic cores over and over and over between the sisters is enough to make them go their separate ways. One of the biggest mysteries here is how the sisters know which direction to go. Are you saying pop? I don't... No, I'm saying you're good. Oh, okay. When, when to change direction and ultimately how this all is coordinated across every chromosome within the cell. It's a lot. Uh, this paper aims to get us started in this knowledge by focusing on which sister changes direction first and by attempting to determine the mechanism that causes the switch in oscillation direction. They do most of their science through imaging live kinetic cores. Uh, and then by using MATLAB to go frame by frame through the videos of the thousands of kinetic cores they looked at to determine trends in which sister switches first. It's all a lot, but it makes for good science. So anyway, <laughs> let's get into the meat of the paper. So the paper starts with the currently accepted model of how the sisters sort of decide when to change a direction. The model suggests that the sisters change a direction when the space between them has low tension. Uh, this occurs when the leading sister changes direction first, shortening the space between them. Then this promotes the trailing sister to change direction. Uh, this model is heavily reliant on the tension itself being the factor that makes the sisters change directions. And the paper ends up proposing a clock mechanism instead that deals with the switch timing. But we'll get into that later. Uh, moving on to figure two, they use this to characterize how they did their imaging as well as how they constructed their standard models. So for imaging, they went through each plane of the cell in a stack in order to form a 3D image. In these pictures, they could detect kinetic cores and then track them. This tracking data could then be put through whatever mathematical algorithm they used. Uh, from this data, they were able to generate a 3D image showing kinetic core locations in relation to the metaphase plate, the center of the cell where division occurs. Uh, they also were able to measure the trajectories of each sister, as well as the angles the sisters were displaced at from the metaphase plate, depending on their distance from the plate. They also took these really cool videos that show how they were able to see the kinetic cores in 3D space, uh, then model them as points, then follow the path of those points, 
and ultimately uh, they could track them against the metaphase plate. So this all seems like background for the rest of their work. On to figures 3 and 4. They take a look at what the distance between the sisters is before and after switching directions. This is dependent on whether or not the leading sister or the trailing sister changes directions first. This is a common theme in the paper, leading versus trailing, or as they refer to it, lead initiated directional switching, LIDS, or trail initiated directional switching, TIDS. This is all characterized in figure 3. Then in figure 4, they show that when the leading sister changes first, there is a lower distance between the two sisters, like this. And when the trailing sister changes first, there is a higher distance between the two sisters, like this. Since the distance between sisters has a positive correlation with the tension between them, lids have lower tension between them compared to tids. Also in figure 4, they begin looking for trends in a cycle of lids than tids, or of tids than lids, as the chromosomes oscillate. Whether or not you come from a lids into a tids or vice versa. Uh, I, I kind of just, I, I, I was kind of like furiously trying to write all that down, and I just now I kind of want to watch it. Can we go back to the kind of the beginning of when it switched to the last slide? Yeah, can I just, I just want to like sit now and absorb it a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Then in figure four, they show that when the leading sister changes first, there is a lower distance between the two sisters, like this. And when the trailing sister changes first, there is a higher distance between the two sisters, like this. Since the distance between sisters has a positive correlation with the tension between them, lids have lower tension between them compared to tids. Also in figure four, they begin looking for trends in a cycle of lids than tids, or of tids than lids, as the chromosomes <laughs> oscillate. Whether or not you come from a lids into a tids or vice versa seem to play a role on the overall tension between the sisters. Uh, they found that tids overall have a lower inner sister distance regardless if the previous switch was a lids or a tids. This can be seen at the end of the graph in 4b. Uh, 4c and 4d are standardized times that sort of zoom in on the first half of 4b. Uh, they show the consistent spike in distance between sisters in tids right after switching direction versus a consistently shortened distance between sisters in lids right after switching. Uh, they stated that besides the changes in tension between the sisters, the dynamics are practically the same. It also seems that the movements uh, seem to be very repetitive, in that many of the kinetic cores reached the same peaks and valleys, and that most of them had the same runtime between switches. All of this consistency and repetition led these scientists to come up with some sort of clock mechanism being the underlying cause of the switches. But yeah. Um, so they're saying, I'm, I'm curious, I'm just, this is pretty interesting to me. I'm just curious. So they're saying like if they watch one of these over time, it 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 basically has the same like pulse between oscillations. Yeah, they have like the same um they they sort of hit like the same timing, I guess, mm -hmm. over and over again. Um I kind of go into it later. It's kind of uh the whole system seems like it's meant to like balance out. Um, and is meant to like maintain that oscillation back and forth to keep them from ripping too early or to keep them from like being stuck together for too long. And so um, what they've like noticed is like this trend, because this is all based on averages here, it's like very similar between a lot of the sister kinetic cores that they move um, sort of in this same pace. Um, it does change like whether or not they do a lids or a tids first or like whatever, but that all depends on like just fluctuation, I guess. Um, in terms of what they're trying to balance out. Yeah, so like I'm, I'm curious how much is it the same, like for the individual and for like the forest, I'm curious about. I, yeah, there's a lot of interesting questions in here, but let's, yeah, I, keep, I, let's keep going. Yeah, from their like models before, it seemed like um, it's, I mean, different for every chromosome. Yeah. Um, but there are just like similar trends in timing of like when the oscillations occur. And I wonder like how chromosome size like play like does that play into like what type of behavior they have like if it's a larger chromosome that's like unwieldy versus a smaller one yeah. probably it wasn't yeah, really yeah. covered in this paper but i mean yeah it'd be, would make sense. that'd be hard that'd be harder to figure out but that'd be yeah that'd be interesting to know never really thought about that how like chromosome fluid dynamics could like affect the behavior of the kinetic core machinery right. Cool. Keep going. Before going into the clock model, we'll take a look at one last figure though. 
So, in figure 5, they focus on the way the sisters twist away from the metal haze plate as they oscillate. They notice that as the distance between sisters increases, there is an inverse relationship with the amount of twist. So, tids with higher tension have smaller angles of twist, versus lids with lower tension have larger angles of twist. Uh, they liken this relationship to the action of a spring, where the high stretch can align the sisters better while they are under more force, versus a uh, low stretch allows the sisters to move more under thermal and mechanical fluctuation. Again, we see similar dynamics being maintained by the tids after lids or tids, and by the lids after lids or tids. The way these dynamics are conserved also plays into their mechanical clock hypothesis. So, figure 6 finally lays out their proposition for a new model of kinetic core oscillation switching. They basically say that, rather than the tension between sisters being the key factor that causes the switch, there is a clock in place that tells the sisters when to switch. This clock is reliant on saving the process from catastrophe. So, if things are out of line, the clock will trigger a switch in order to achieve balance again. If forces level out, the clock will allow the oscillation to continue. So. In figure 6a, we see their diagram showing that both sisters have a clock in place to deal with the coordination of switching. The dotted blue arrow indicates that if the leading sister accelerates too quickly, it will switch first since the tension between the sisters is too high for a tids to cause even more tension. So if you think about it, too much tension too early on could result in an early splitting of the sister chromatids before cell division is ready, which could lead to chromosome missegregation. With that catastrophe taken care of, the solid blue arrow in the diagram shows that if the movement is stabilized, or if the leading sister is too slow, the trailing sister will move first to increase the tension in the system. This will help keep the chromosomes aligned with the metaphase plate. 6b shows that if you initially have a lids which lowers the tension, but the leading sister in the next oscillation accelerates fast enough, the chromosome can handle another lids. Whereas if you initially have a lids and the leading sister doesn't accelerate enough and keep a balanced amount of tension between the sisters, a tids will occur to raise the tension and help maintain the balance between them. Initial tids show a similar trend that, if the high tension is lowered over the course of the oscillation, the sisters can handle raising the tension again with another tids on the next oscillation. This is where they show how the standard model from figure 1 is kind of wrong. So if an initial tids still has high tension by the end of the oscillation, a lids will occur to lower the tension between the sisters. This contradicts the standard model in that over time in an oscillation after tids, the tension is slowly decreasing, yet a lids can still be triggered from it. This shows that it is not the growing tension between the sisters that triggers the lids, but rather a high tension between the sisters that has been maintained for too long, allowing the clock to click into place and help balance out the system. In terms of the importance of these findings, I think that this is a great start in more kinetic core specifics. Learning how cells are able to manage chromosome segregation and regulate the timing of everything can provide a lot of insight on cell division. Incorrectly conducted cell division can lead to so many issues like cancers if conducted too often or things like birth defects or even death if the DNA is not conserved correctly during fetal formation. So, although this is one small part of the equation, continuing to learn more about how cells can detect these tension-related boundaries and can make these decisions to maintain themselves can further our understanding in chromosome segregation-related health problems. Uh, aside from just being interesting science, research like this is the groundwork for so many potential future projects. So one thing I really liked about this paper is how well done their models are. Their figure 6 is easily legible and lays out their exact hypothesis clearly through flowcharts. One improvement to this model would have been some movement. So the model I'm proposing is animated. Just a simple model to show when a tids or lids would be necessary for the sister chromatids. This would pair nicely with their drawn model in figure 6, particularly figure 6b, and seeing as they've already included other videos for their 3D models, they could show a simplified 2D motion of the kinetic cores they're describing. And one other quick... Oh, uh, are you muted? You might be muted. Yes, I'm muted. Could you, is it possible for you to easily adjust the playback speed of that video right now? Um, do you know how to do that? Maybe. I don't know. I, don't actually know. I did, um, for the animated model, I have a separate file where I have it repeat a couple more times. Okay. Um, so we can open that up. Yeah, I just wanted, to, at the end, that's fine. I just wanted to see it slowed down a little bit. Yeah. And um, you don't have to do it right now. Let's just keep going, and then we can okay. come back to that at the end. Just, yeah, for, just for me, I wanted to see that. Okay.
way to understand why the chromosomes are oscillating the way they do is to use a household object to simplify the process. So take your two index fingers, each as a sister chromatid, and wrap a rubber band around them to signify the tension between the sisters. Now oscillate your fingers to the right and have your right finger move left first. This is a lids. You'll notice the rubber band lose tension and begin to fall, so to compensate, you'll then have to move your left finger in order to uphold the tension. From here, you can experiment a little bit with the ways acceleration during oscillation plays a role in which sister switches first. So let's say you're moving to the right again and your right finger is moving faster than your left finger. You'll find that a lot of tension has built up by the time you reach the end of the oscillation. So if you attempt a tids by moving your left finger to the left first, you'll notice the tension only increases, making it a lot harder to hold onto the rubber band. Versus, if you were to attempt a lids by moving your right finger to the left first, you'll notice the tension decreases, making upholding the rubber band a lot more manageable. Feel free to play around with a rubber band and further your understanding of sister kinetic cord directional switching. It's a really simplified way to visualize this pretty complex topic. Other than that, this concludes my presentation, so thanks for watching, y'all. Uh, what do you got? What else do you have? I, I can find my model file, um, but I don't really have anything for like a discussion assignment. Oh, we don't? Or a okay. discussion thing. Um, yeah. Other than like play with a rubber band, try and figure it out. It's kind of a lot. Like I said, yeah. So I, I would say that I had a hard time, you know, it's just like a lot, it's just a lot to absorb and think about spatially yeah. in my mind. Cause uh, you know, there's just, a, there was a lot coming at us and it was sweet. I didn't know you were in a JITS lab. Um, yes. Yeah. He's, he's an interesting mind. I like, I like his science a lot. So th th yeah, uh, that's cool. Um, also, but then it really clicked for me with the rubber band thing. So I recommend everyone, grab a rubber band and actually do that because as soon as you do this with your fingers it totally makes sense everything yeah that was described to me verbally and visually that was kind of tough for me to grasp as soon as i did it like that i, I understood it because it was like it's impossible for this one to start switching as if it's going this way if it's already way stretched out like or other way the other way around you know it's impossible for this one to switch first because it's already so stretched out that this one needs to switch first but I lost my rubber band, it shot off or my hair tie. I will say one thing about the rubber band model. It, it's easy to envision how high tension causes it, causes it to switch, but it's actually harder to envision how low tension would cause it to switch just because it's easy to keep your fingers not under tension and it's hard to understand like conceptually why it's a bad thing to have that low tension. Yeah, um, part of that, like when I use that spring from earlier, I feel like that kind of helps describe it Yeah. Um, in terms of like, just like, it's too much movement. Um, also, like if your fingers are too close together, then like the rubber band can drop and you kind of want to maintain it like in the center as well, I guess. Um, I don't really know. <laughs> Not, it's a good model. It was just a thought. M yeah. Maybe if you imagine a spike hovering between your fingers that you don't want either finger to hit. Uh, yeah, like if there's too low tension, maybe the machinery starts to disconnect. Yeah. You know, hmm. that, that's a possibility. There's a, I, so I thought of a discussion question. Yeah. Can we, can we do that? Yeah, sure. So we're talking about tension here and the pulling back and the, the back and forth and how that's going to affect sister. Uh, how did you say chromatid? Chromatid? Chromatids. Yeah, yeah. I, like, I like that pronunciation. That's cool. Chromatid. <laughs> uh, it sounds way more like, I don't know, like chromagnon. Uh, chromatid. I like it. Um, so we're talking about that, that change in the chromatids as they go back and forth uh, and are pulling on each other and how the tension in between them affects their dynamics and their behavior. And Simran was talking about e here, and we talked a lot about e here and epithelial cells, and that's the world that I know. So how do you think an interplay and kind of dance and back and forth oscillation might affect stickiness between cells, for example, and like cancer? Um, so think about that in breakout rooms and we'll come back. Uh, all rooms are open. And we are going, oh no, we're still pretty good on time actually.
Yeah, I thought I would join you too. Just hang out with you. Hi, Connor. Hi, Ian. Can you hear me? I was, I was wondering what was going on. I was in a, I was a group by myself. So, yeah. So I was wondering, you know, I just <laughs> no one. Yeah, somebody was. Some, yeah, somebody was AFK and they didn't join you, so I put you in here with Ian. Uh, but oh, I don't perfect. Know, I, I, Ian might be a way too. You know, some people. You know, as with these online classes, you know, it's like people can. If they gotta go to the bathroom or whatever, they can just go to the bathroom. Right, yeah, uh, sorry, can, guys. I was using the bathroom. Yeah, I see. Oh, good call. Good <laughs> call. Good. No, you're all good, Ian. Uh, uh, we were just talking about, or we're going to talk about, um, how, like, the tension between ECAT here and between, um, yeah, hold on. I'll, I'll be right back. Um, do you remember the question, Connor? Um, I didn't. Basically, just how the force between the cells might affect like cancer or like normal tissue behavior. Oh, okay, yeah, that, yeah. That dance okay. back and forth that we're seeing between the DNA. How might a dance like that between the cells affect things? Okay. Does that make sense? Is it a division? Or do you mean just like as neighboring cells? As neighboring cells or, di okay. or, di or during division, whatever you want, the question's open. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, okay, cool. Let me, hi Aaron, what's up? Hi, hey, uh, so I think all three of our computers disconnected a little bit when you were explaining what we were supposed to be uh, okay. doing right now so, yeah, we didn't so okay well that's that's fine we were talking about i was just curious how you guys think like the force oscillations that we're seeing at the dna level you know there's going to be some of those force oscillations happening at the cell junctions too right back and forth and i was just curious how you thought that force interplay might be important for you know maintaining junctions or changing directions or like affecting cell behavior kind of open open and open ended question just taking what we learned about dna and like what do we already kind of know about junctions and how how might that affect things okay Does that makes sense yeah cool all right thanks yeah You're muted. Oh, there you Thanks, I noticed. Thank you. Uh, did you? Can you hear me? One. Do you want to? Do you want to kind of just lead us through this? This discussion. Sure. I, I, you could do it. Uh, you don't have to like share what you're saying. Just kind of like ask the group and just kind of lead it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess who. What, what came up in people's conversations then uh, about Tori's question? Well, one thought that we had had is that, so let's say there's an oscillating force acting at the edge of the cell. Well, when it pulls harder, neighboring cells are gonna start pulling harder in response, yeah? Just to make sure that they aren't pulled themselves. 
Well, when the force is reduced, I doubt that the neighboring cells are going to reduce their forces that quickly, just to have to build it up again. So maybe that actually starts providing the force necessary to pull the two different cells once they start separating apart from each other. Right, that's, yeah, that's interesting. Kind of like, um, cause there are those like microtubules that have to reach out to like the outer cortexes of the cell. So mm -hmm. like having to do with those as the oscillations occur. I guess would kind of be uh, something like that. That's that really stimulated something in my mind about. So we've talked a little bit and touched on the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is a freaking mouthful to say. I can barely ever get that phrase out. But that's like when you have your your epithelial cells and your tumor or whatever, and they start to. It's not always in cancer. It's in development and stuff too. But when they, you know, become more crawly and mobile, like those fibroblasts, and start crawling around, that transition from being junctiony, stable to moving and crawly. Um, and I wonder, like, going off what Aaron said, like, do these cells like charge up this oscillation between each other before they like rip apart and become the sinkable cells? Because cells do that. Embryos do that. Like before, in like sea urchins and stuff. I might, I wonder if I can find a video from this. I could probably get one. Uh, before it divides, you know, see, if we think about an embryo this size, if it was like this big, it stimulates these waves of rho activation that just like form these bands and like just ripple across it. And they're just like pulsing and oscillating. And it seems like it's for apparently no reason, but it's like to charge up the machinery before it pinches itself in two. At least that's kind of what we think. And so... It may, yeah, it would make sense if you're going to rip two cells apart or two DNA things apart. You kind of got to charge up a little bit. You know, Sonic, he's got to crouch and you got to mash A before you can start spinning and doing ramps. You got to charge up. So that's a cool, yeah, thank you for sharing that. All right, what else we got? We were thinking that um, like when a cell, like when you have like the kind of the cars running, the cell is sort of gonna have a lot of movement going on inside. And so that movement might cause sort of, I guess, stress between the dividing cell and the neighboring cells. So then to sort of stabilize the connection between those cells, you would want sort of more ECAD here and there to sort of keep the cells connected. But yeah. Were you talking about like the like cytoplasm flow within the cell? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, sort of like, yeah, like um, you've got the kind of cords running and sort of like, it's like you've got the contents of the cell sort of going from one side to the other. Mm -hmm. And um, that sort of leads to a lot of movement within that cell, which I guess sort of weakened the connection between that cell and its neighboring cells. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. So if you have like, are you talking about maybe like, like, like this kind of movement? Like if you have like, because, you know, rather than it being like this movement, it's oh, no, like yeah, no, this kind of, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah like that. Hmm. Yeah, like sliding. Yeah, there are like cadherins and stuff. Like N cadherin is a cadherin that allows like this type of motion more so than like E cadherin, uh, which doesn't per like allow as much lateral motion, I think. Yeah, that's a thinking about the content like sloshing around and how that's affecting things. Yeah, that's cool too. Cool. Yeah, I mean, um, are there any other questions about any of this um, or anything else that came up in your conversations? Uh, I was just wondering, do you know if the code is available for that or? Or which, like the like the models that they made, I guess, or like the way they tracked the movement. Um, it's like all kind of laid out in the paper. I can put the link, um, like towards the end. I think they talk about it, um, and like what specifically they used to like okay. in MATLAB to do. Um, sure. So I just pasted that in the chat. Okay. Thanks. Uh, I wasn't really sure what they were saying when they were talking about it in the paper. So um, yeah.